So let's go ahead and get started. Just want to welcome you to the first of many uh, lectures in our series. Uh, my name is Natasha Wingreen. I am the Outreach Director at New Haven Reads. Um, at New Haven Reads, our mission is to increase the literacy skills of children by providing individually tailored one-on-one -on -one after school tutoring, educational family support, and a community book bank, all at no cost to participants. In addition to our free book bank and tutoring program, New Haven Reads offers early readiness classes for pre-K and kindergarten students, as well as resources for teachers. In March, our tutoring program reached over 500 students with over 375 active volunteers. While our programming has had to adapt to recent months, we continue to support our families and students through the online tutoring and book bank distribution sites. Through this lecture series, we are excited to hear from experts, likewise invested in promoting literacy and expanding educational access and to share this experience and knowledge with the wider New Haven community. So thank you for joining us to today's lecture. Just a few housekeeping items. So to see the speaker only while she is doing her lecture, please adjust, please adjust to the speaker view option in the upper right hand corner of your screen. To help ensure a quality experience for all, uh, please keep yourself on mute. And then following the lecture, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. Please do so by typing a private message to the host using the chat function in Zoom. I will then read your questions to our guest speaker for a response. So we are so thrilled to introduce Dr. Laura Reynolds. Laura Reynolds is a professor at Southern Connecticut State University and a program co coordinator of the graduate reading department. She has a PhD in language and literacy from Fordham University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Haskin Laboratories. She spent many years teaching young English learners in the public schools and is certified in reading, TESOL, bilingual literacy, and Spanish. Her research interests lie in the intersection of language and literacy as it applies to students who are learning English as well as to students with dyslexia. She has presented her research at international conferences and has various publications in peer-reviewed journals. She is married to a teacher and has two children, both of whom are teachers. Please welcome Dr. Reynolds. Thank you very much. Shall I go ahead and start now, Natasha? Yeah, please do. All right, here we go. So thank you all for coming and, and um, coming and hearing a little bit of an overview about teaching literacy to English learners. Uh, let me get this. There we go. So I'm going to give you a little bit of just an overview of English learners in Connecticut. Um, as you can see on this slide, the majority of them um, speak Spanish. But we have, I believe it's 115 different languages spoken in Connecticut and often schools will have multiple languages. That's the, the rule more than the exception. Um, we see we have Portuguese, a lot of Arabic. We have um, in New Haven, I believe, is uh, one of the largest Syrian refugee um, resettlement cities in the country. Um, we have Chinese, we have Haitian Creole, um, Polish, uh, Albanian, um, and a multitude of other languages that have uh, fewer, fewer than 1% of the, the speakers. Um, most of our English language learners are concentrated in the cities. So you can see Hartford has 20% of English learners. Uh, Bridgeport has 17%. New Haven has 16%. Over 3,500 English learners in the New Haven schools. Um, when you think about 7.6% total in Connecticut, that's over two kids or two kids in a class of 25. So um, every teacher encounters English learners throughout Connecticut. And it's actually the cities that do a better job of educating English learners than the richer districts and the rural districts. Um, the cities 
you know, have enough students that they know what they're doing. They hire more English uh, ESL teachers. Um, but in the rural districts and in the, even in the richer districts, they um, often are at a loss to, to know how to educate these children. Um, it's not true that you have to speak the language that the child, the child speaks to, to be able to be an effective teacher. And there's really no way that we could speak all of the languages um, that are spoken in Connecticut. Uh, the larger cities will have some bilingual programs which are, are um, helpful for the children, but not all of our L's can be served or are served through bilingual education. So most of our L's also um, have poverty uh, going along with, with, the, with their um, academic risks. Um, and it's really the poverty that is um, even more important than, than their English language status. So the National In Institute of Health actually put out a statement saying that the greatest risk for academic failure is not a learning disability nor second language learning. The greatest, the highest risk for reading failure is socioeconomic status. So often our English learners come from, from um, because they've immigrated um, often, they also have this poverty as, as a risk. Um, but not all of our English language learners, of course, um, come from a low socioeconomic um, household. Uh, Yale has, around Yale, there's quite a few um, English learners who are children of professors who have come from other countries, uh, for example, or um, in Stanford where, where um, uh, you might also see something similar. Those children have lots of resources. Um, so they really are not as at risk as other students. When we look for uh, who is eligible for free and reduced lunch, we see that the English learners, it's almost 70% are um, eligible for free lunch and you know, you have to have a pretty low income rate to, to receive free lunch as opposed to non-English non learners. So you can see that they, they um, almost 80% of English learners are eligible for free or reduced lunch. Um, so as we were talking, that socioeconomic status is a factor that can distinguish one student from another. We do have L's from middle class and wealthy backgrounds, but the vast majority um, are from low SES um, households. But it's important to know that all students, regardless of their socioeconomic status, have really valuable experiences that they can bring to the classroom and that we should really use them as a basis for their learning. Um, you know, I. There was a, a one time I was teaching summer school and I brought my daughter along. She was very young at the time. And I had a little girl from Mexico who uh, we were reading a story about a chicken. And my daughter was, I think, seven. And the girl, um, and she was, the girl was young. She was maybe seven or eight also. But she went through the entire process of how you take a live chicken and get, get it from the live chicken state to the chicken on the table state. <laughs> And I'm thinking, what amazing background knowledge. She knew, like, if I was stuck on an, on an island with somebody, I'd want to be stuck with her. Um, but that, my Alexis, a lunch. Um, but that kind of background knowledge, as valuable as it is, is not, is not um, helpful in school, unfortunately. Um, it should be. Uh, and we should really take take a look at our, the experiences our students have, all of our students have, to see how we can um, use that for learning. Uh, another example I have is I did a, um, I was working with second graders and we did a whole unit on plants. And because I was almost going to be a botany major, I, I loved plants. So we, they, most of their parents were gardeners and they had a real feel for how to grow plants and, and all of the things that were needed. 
and we went into such depth. We learned about um, uh, uh, monocots and dicots and parallel vein structure and all the language that went along with it. And um, we did this around Christmas time. And at the end of the year, and I, we grew corn and beans and all kinds of fun things. At the end of the year, the, ch the children still had those plants growing because I sent them home with them and they kept them alive for six months. And I know they would have been dead if it were up to me. But um, so all this is to say that all of our children have interesting background knowledge or knowledge that's worthwhile, but not all of it's valued in school. You know, the, the kids from wealthier um, families may have gone to museums and, you know, traveled to Europe or whatever. Um, and that knowledge seems to be, you know, more valued than, than some of the other types of knowledge that kids bring. But we should really make sure that we value all the children and all of their um, experiences and bring it to school. So this is an interesting slide that I had to put together just from various um, sources. English learners are overrepresented in special ed. And if you look at the um, columns where they're higher, they're all related to language. So you see they're, they're almost twice as represented in speech language impairment. Um, in learning disabilities, which often has to do with dyslexia, which is a language based, um, or in reading in general, which also has to do with language. And the only other place that they are overrepresented are in intellectually disabled, which again, you can see how language would, would um, factor into that. Uh, they're not overrepresented in autism, which is a little more um, maybe clear cut to diagnose, um, not overrepresented in emotionally disabled kids, other health impaired, but anything having to do with language, look at the difference, they're overrepresented. Now, where this happens is not usually in the urban districts. Again, this is what happens in the richer districts and in um, the rural districts where they don't have experience with L's. They can't, they don't have the, the faculty to teach them. So they, you know, very kind heartedly, they think that, um, well, let's give them to the special ed teacher because they'll know what to do. But, you know, classifying a child as special ed when they're not, that's, that's very serious stuff. And it's, um, would cause more harm than good in, in my estimation. So, we're not doing right by our English learners um, in many cases. We're not giving them what they need. Um, the other thing I didn't put up a slide about, but I was shocked when I moved to Connecticut from New York. <clears throat> when I was in New York, I was an ESL teacher and we had very strict rules and regulations and legislation as to how many minutes per day each child needed to be seen by a certified ESL teacher. So in New York, a beginner or an intermediate student, language student, um, would get 70 minutes per day by a certified ESL teacher or ELL teacher. Um, and if you were advanced, you still got 35 minutes per day. And even when you graduated, you passed your language proficiency test, you still were entitled to support. There is none of that legislation in Connecticut. Um, there's no teeth. They say that they need to be supported, but there's no teeth in the law. So often our English learners are taught by paraprofessionals, which may or may not do a really good job. Um, there's no uh, laws as to how many, how many minutes per day of instruction they get. Um, often they get very little from people that are specialized in this area. So Connecticut has a ways to catch up. Um, so we talked about socioeconomic status. So we need to remember that all English learners are not alike. Um, next, we're gonna talk about how familiar they are with English and their school experiences. So um, English learners can be uh, classified as either an immigrant or if they were born in the United States. Um, and the overwhelming majority of our English learners were born here, um, born to immigrant parents. Um, so our, our English learners are the majority, they're citizens. Um, if they were born here, they, what often happens, well, what, what can happen uh, is that um, 
they can learn both languages at once from birth. And this might happen if the father speaks English and the mother speaks another language or vice versa. Um, those are called simultaneous bilinguals. But what often happens is that um, both parents, of course, would be um, immigrants and they speak their native language until they start going to school. So this, and then when they begin to go to school, they, they start learning English. So this becomes a problem for teachers because what happens is their, their native language, say if they were Spanish speakers, they come to school with a four or five year old level of Spanish speaking. Then they start learning English and they don't, if they're not in a bilingual program, they don't learn to read or their Spanish kind of, in Spanish, their Spanish kind of stops developing. And so now they're, they're left when they're seven or six or seven, their Spanish is, is still at that four year old level, but their English is not at, the English is still developing too. So they're left with two languages that are, are at a lower level of development. So like a four year old Spanish and a four year old English, but they're seven years old. So this makes them appear as if they have a language um, deficit, a language disability, when in truth they don't. Um, so it's, it's kind of, that's probably one of the reasons why they're getting overclassified in speech and language. Um, the other way is that they could be a recent immigrant, um, but recent immigrants, depending on where they're from, they may come with some knowledge of English. They may have taken English lessons in their, their um, home country. Again, this also depends on socioeconomic status, right? Or they may come with little or no English. Um, those of uh, immigrants with um, higher, the higher SES or might have come, um, might have left a country that was war-torn, um, but yet they were professionals in their, their home country, they probably come with a good knowledge of English. I know I, I worked with a child of a, a woman from Colombia who was a judge in Colombia, but had to leave because of the drug wars back then. Very well educated woman working as a cleaning lady because she, um, that's all she could get and she had to run for her life. Uh, the past school experiences are also, again, a big factor in our, our English learners. Um, sometimes they come with very little or uh, formal education. Uh, we forget that in lots of areas of the world, um, they don't have public education um, and certainly not through high school. I remember one of my um, student, my smartest students, he was so smart, learned to read like so quickly, just as smart as a whip. When I talked to the father, um, he had only been able to go to school up to second grade. And you think, you know, if the son was so smart, the father was probably just as smart as the son, but had no access to education. Um, what's even more common is this inconsistent or sporadic education in their, their native countries where sometimes they could go to school, sometimes they couldn't. Um, if you think of our, our immigrants from Syria where, um, you know, the schools were bombed, you know, that's certainly kids with interrupted education. Um, very rarely, this is what we'd love, but this is not, uh, doesn't happen very often. Uh, they, they regularly attend one school with a consistent and appropriate curriculum. That's kind of the, the exception rather than the rule. Um, so quickly, factor myth. Young children are better at learning a second language than adults. Kind of yes and no. All of these are both yes and no. Um, they, young children will eventually um, uh, outgrow people that were older when, when they learned the language. Young children, if you learn your language and you're young, you're not going to have an accent. You're not, um, your grammar is going to sound um, native-like. Um, but at the beginning, uh, older people learn language faster um, because they can, they have more cognitive ability. They can compare one language to the other. They can learn rules. So at the beginning, the older people take off, but the young children catch up and then exceed them in the long run. Uh, math is easy for English learners because numbers are universal. Well, that's true, but um, so much of our math is language embedded, especially in schools. 
you know, they have to explain their answer, they have to read the word problems, all of that. Um, immersion is the best way to learn a second language. Not in itself, the, the children really need some support to learn that second language. Getting lots of input, from, hearing lots of English is certainly a good thing, but immersion without support is not, will not, um, is not the best way to learn a language. And then a child's first language interferes with his or her ability to learn a second language. Again, true and not true. So there's lots of resources that the child brings from their first language. They can transfer lots and lots of um, knowledge about reading from one language to the other. But there are a few things that might cause um, some temporary um, interference. Um, you know, particular sounds that don't exist in their first language, particular grammatical structures and things like that. But what the research says, generally speaking, is that English learners learning to read in English, just like English learners, just like English native English speakers learning to read in English, they benefit from good instruction, which is really explicit teaching of the components of literacy, such as phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension, and writing. So in many respects, what works for learners in general will work for L. So you shouldn't, you should feel um, as tutors that that you're, you're capable of, of teaching English learners um, because the basics work for, for everybody. Um, so oral language development is, is a, a, a big factor in reading development. Um, if you don't have a good oral language, you, your, your reading is going to be compromised. Um, remember that receptive language, the understanding is generally better than expressive language. So they can always understand more than they can speak. Um, but we'll see some ways that this oral language development really uh, influences reading. Um, so we know that English learners, um, they may have good conversational skills. They may not have an accent. They may uh, sound um, perfectly fine when you're talking to them face to face, but they still may not have the language that's needed for school and school achievement. And it's this uh, lack of academic language that causes them to um, have trouble with academic achievement. So I think I have, oh, almost, I'm gonna have a movie in a minute. So we need to understand the difference between conversational English and academic English. Um, that social language kids can pick up without any instruction at all. That you just put them with other kids. In two years, they'll sound just like all the other kids. They can get along with everybody. They, if they're young enough, they won't have an accent. Um, that for the early years of uh, schooling, it's probably enough. But what happens as they get to the older grades is that that language will not carry them through um, trying to learn uh, the academic content in the upper elementary school and beyond. So um, they need more than just that, what they call playground English. They need this academic English to read academic texts. Um, and academic English has a lot more complex vocabulary. It has more complex grammatical structures. Um, and this is the piece that, that really, unless attention is given to developing this academic English, which really all children need, um, but English learners especially, this is what's gonna cause them to <clears throat> have difficulties in the older grades. So I don't know if you've heard of the fourth grade slump um, this happens to a lot of our kids and they really feel it's due to vocabulary. And again, this academic English piece. Um, so some of the words that are, are part of academic English, some of them are the ones you would think of, like the content related terms, like absorb, photosynthesis, chlorophyll, all those words that you would learn in a science class. But there's also other groups of words that we sometimes forget about that um, cause trouble. Words that have to do with the directions of the, the task, like compare, contrast, analyze, discuss. All of this is vocabulary that needs to be taught. 
And then some of the ones that we really forget about are these words that are needed to put sentences together, like however, since, therefore, nevertheless. If you don't know that, that one word, nevertheless, you're reading along, you come to a word I don't know, and then you nevertheless, and then you keep reading. But the whole, the whole point has changed. The whole uh, direction has reversed, right, of the, the article. So these words are also really important to pay attention to as you're reading. They need specific instruction. So that's really important to remember. Uh, so I have a nice little video just to see, so you can see the difference between this, this um, playground English, it's also called VIX, um, or, and the academic English. So as you're watching this, I want you to uh, see what happens when a child appears to have acquired English, but in reality, they've only acquired conversational English. So, um, and then watch her eyes <laughs> and her hands during this video. This is, this is a really, really powerful one for me anyway. Where are you from? Honduras, where are you from? I'm from California. How long have you lived here? Two years. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have lived here for four years, almost four years. Yeah. Do you like it here? Yes. Yeah. What do you like about it? Uh, people are nice and I have a lot of friends here. Um, I especially like the food from here. Oh yeah? What kind of food? Uh, hamburgers and pizza. Oh, pizza. I like pizza too. What kind of food do you eat in Honduras? Um, we eat a, a lot of food, but mostly I like a food. Um, the eggs and the beans and the cheese. Oh, do you eat that food here too? Yeah, since yeah. my mom makes them. Oh, what's what's the your favorite food that your mom makes? Spaghetti. Oh yeah, I love spaghetti. Do you like to cook? Do you help your mom in the kitchen? Yes. Yeah. What do you do? Can you help her? Um, I just sometimes she goes to the store with me and buy some of the things that she's gonna do for for um for the food. Oh, so you help her with the groceries? Yes. Oh, that's great. Okay, we've been learning about where plants get their energy from. So how are the roots important to a plant? Um, the roots of a plant takes in um, um, the, the water of the, um, of the, of the plant. Um, they, they help the plants grow more if they're from the sun. Okay, and how are stems important to a plant? Um, Um, they're pointing to a plant so um they they can um get um um sun, water and some other things. Okay, and how do the green leaves of the plant make sugar? Um, when the water falls in into the leaves in, in the um in, in, in the um when when the water falls into the leaves in the um in the in the leaf. So you could really see there that um, when she was first talking, um, she was fine. You know, sound like she was fine. She knows English, right? Um, a little bit, a little trouble when she had to use that word grocery when she said how do you help your mom in the kitchen and she was like uh you saw the hands start to go and look the eyes looking up um but then when we went to the academic content she just didn't have the the language necessary to to put those thoughts together it was really we can't tell if she knew that stuff she knew the content and just didn't have the language to to express it or she didn't know the content um, I kind of think she knew it because she was like pointing to the roots, but didn't have the, the, um, the word roots. Um, she didn't have the word, how does the stem help the plant? Well, it provides structural, and, you know, she's not going to have that kind of uh, uh, vocabulary. Um, so that, that kind that movie always brings it home to me of, of how, um, that academic English is so different from the conversational English. So how do we help our children acquire academic English? Well, the most important thing is that they have to understand what we, we say to them. Um, 
So language is the weakness. So we have to supplement language with other things. Um, we have to provide some kind of visual um, input for that language. So somehow we have to take what we're saying and not just have it in a pure lecture, but to give um, visual aids um, to help support that. Something as simple as writing things down will help them be able to segment that long string of language in, into words so that they can, they can um, understand it. Um, pictures, um, any kind of graphic organizer trying to, to, um, to use a, a diagram to, to help them understand. Um, that will be really important. Um, so these are just some ways to make um, your, what you say understandable. Uh, gestures are really, are really um, a simple, free thing that makes a lot of difference. Um, I have another video, if I had time, I would show you so you could see the difference. Um, I have a video in Portuguese, one without gestures and one with gestures. The gestures really help. So get used to using your hands a lot when you talk. Um, I used to do this so much, my kids would make fun of me, you know, mom, do you want some milk to go with your coffee? <laughs> but, but really a simple, simple thing is using gestures when you speak is, is very effective. Uh, writing down things, having them see it in print, that's gonna help. Um, again, using very clear routines, doing the same thing every week. I know you're, you're, um, you're, you have a good routine when you, you do your tutoring, right? Um, but that routine help, helps them to really um, understand what's happening. Uh, repeating infor information uh, or paraphrasing it in something shorter or simpler. Watch out for those idioms. We have so many of them and we don't even realize it when we're, when, that we're saying them when we say them. Um, just think of the word, uh, and sometimes it's the small words that get, get people into the most trouble. Um, think of the word run, right? You can run over something. You can run, um, run into something. You can run, uh, run on. You can use a run on sentence. You can, there's, there's so many words with run um, that, that can be quite confusing. And because it's our native language, you don't even realize it when we're saying it. Um, when you present new information, connect it to something that they already know. This is all just good teaching, right? Announcing your lesson objectives each day before you teach. Presenting information in a variety of ways, especially um, not just pure lecture, right? Have it um, do videos, do all that kind of thing. And then always giving a summary um, and paying attention to language. If you take, have one takeaway, is to pay attention to language when you teach. Uh, here's some more uh, supports for comprehensible input. Basically, just speaking slow, a little more, a little slower. I didn't, I never spoke that slowly when I, I, I taught my English learners, but a, a little slower and clearer, you know, not louder. <laughs> they can hear, do you understand me? Yeah, you don't have to do that. I've seen people do that. Um, but monitor your vocabulary a little bit. Just pay attention to the words you're using. Um, and use lots of other objects, pictures, diagrams, anything that's not just straight blah, blah, blah language, right? And keep it kind of uh, simple. Um, so I know I'm running over time, but I just want to do a quick little uh, finish of this. The decoding piece, learning to recognize the words, that's that, well, reading, well, let's talk a little bit. Reading instruction is based on decoding, right? Rec saying those words. And then the vocabulary and the background knowledge. That's the other piece of it. Um, believe it or not, the decoding is not usually the major source of difficulty for English learners. If they get good instruction, they can learn it just like monolinguals. They can learn at the same rate. Um, this is all with good instruction, though. Um, systematic instruction and decoding. If they get that good instruction, they can learn to decode. That's not the problem, unless they have another reading difficulty like dyslexia. The problem is in the vocabulary, the academic 
language, and that general knowledge about the world that helps you understand what you read. Um, these things are so important and they make up comprehension. Um, so good instruction for English learners always includes attention to language, always provides comprehensible input. Just make sure that your students are understanding what you're saying, check on it. Um, includes a lot of contextual and visual support, something other than talk, 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 right? Builds vocabulary and checks for background knowledge, but also builds background knowledge. Um, and what they know about comprehension is the more you know about a, a subject, the easier it is to comprehend a, what, what you read about a subject. Um, if I read a, a pharmacy uh, article about some drug development, I wouldn't understand a single thing that they said, even though I could read all the words, because I don't have that background knowledge. And it's the same for our children. Some children come with tons of background knowledge that, that um, is valued by school, as we said before. They very rarely read how to, how to take a chicken from chicken to stew, right? They don't read about that. If they did, they would be the ones that would know the most and would have the best comprehension. So this has just been a real general overview. Um, I love working with English learners. I love working with their families. They're, they're a lot of fun to work with. And so I want to encourage you to feel competent and um, not feel nervous about having to work with English learners because you, you can do a good job if you just kind of pay attention to some of these, um, these little things. So. Any questions? Great, thank you so much. Um, I think they're coming in now. So let's see, it says, I have a student, I tutor virtually, not through New Haven Reads. She is an American born child whose parents speak Spanish. She has a great deal of difficulty with small words like of, from, her. I think she may have a learning disability. Any suggestions? So we're talking about words that are irregular, that don't follow the phonics rules. Is that what she's saying? Because of, from, and her, well, her does, but of and from are irregular words. Mm -hmm. um, Any advice on irregular words? Um, yeah, if you, if you, they need to be explicitly taught and they need a lot of practice. And sometimes the little words are the hardest words for them to use because they, have so many multiple meanings. Um, uh, for example, you can translate of to Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. um, day, but it, it's used in, in, a, in, a, in a lot of, in a whole different way. So my advice would be just to, to keep practicing, um, you know, even flashcards, those kinds of things so that they can read them and then give them sentences that, um, that are meaningful and talk about the, what the sentences mean because hmm. you need to have that meaning connection with the the actual word recognition piece um, but you know english learners do have learning disabilities at the same rate as monolingual kids so um one of the issue, one of the ways you can tell if a kid has um a learning disability is if you're teaching something and you're teaching it and you're teaching it and you're teaching it and they learn it one day and forget it the next day and they learn it one day and they forget it the next day um, so yeah, I, I couldn't give much advice other than that, just without seeing the child. Okay. Um, next question is, should we be teaching them idioms too? Won't they need them? Yes, yes. Um, so when we teach vocabulary, there's, you know, as a college educated adult or even just, a, just any, any adult, you know about 50,000 words. So, it's when we teach vocabulary, one of the biggest things we have to think about is what vocabulary to teach because there's so many of them to teach. Um, so yes, you need to teach idioms if they're important to understanding the academic text, right? So when I think about um, teaching English learners, it's always in context of school academics. Um, so is this idiom important for understanding that, that content of the text? I mean, if it is, I'm going to teach it. But there's so many, you know, you might come across so many words that you can't teach them all. So you really have to get kind of um, judicial about which ones you're going to spend your time on. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so last question we have is, can you talk about a parent who only speaks a different language continuing to read to their child in that language? Oh, is absolutely. that still beneficial to the child learning to read English? Absolutely. Um, you want that child to develop their first language as much as possible because that's going to make it easier for them to learn English. And that seems like a contradiction, but I'll give you an example about so it becomes a little clearer. Um, I speak Spanish, but you know, I probably speak about a four-year-old or five-year-old type Spanish. Um, so if I were, if I were living in a Spanish country, um, I would, uh, and I would want to take my. And someone told me, "Don't speak your la native language to your child," or I haven't, and my child is not able to speak the native language anymore, which happens. If I was to take my daughter for to shop for a prom dress, for example. I would say, let's buy a dress, I could say in Spanish, um, a long dress, a pretty dress, a blue dress, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But I couldn't say, you know, let's buy a dress with a sweetheart neckline and, you know, and a sash and, you know, do you want lace on that? Um, I, I wouldn't have that, um, those concepts developed in my native language. Um, so when you, when you speak in the native language to your child, you're developing concepts so that all the English teacher has to do is say, oh, lace means this. This is how you say, it. you know, one, I don't have to talk about what is lace, you know. Um, another way to think about it is try to describe what a fox is, um, how a fox differs from a dog, right? Mm. So you could say a fox has pointy ears. Well, so do some dogs. A fox lives outside. Well, so do some dogs. You know, I want to, how are you telling me what a, how a fox is different than a dog? A fox has um, a pointed nose. Well, so do some dogs. But if I, if I know what a fox is, if I see the fox and say, this is Soro, this is fox, and this is a dog, all I have to do is translate Soro and fox. I don't have to spend an hour explaining what a fox is and how it differs from a dog. So when they're developing their native language, um, Plus the fact that you want them to be able to talk to their grandparents, right? You want mm -hmm. them to be able to communicate. I mean, not even talking about the emotional piece of it, which is so important, but just for the, from the academic point of view, it makes the English teacher's job a lot easier because it's so easy just to learn the translation of a word um, if they already know what that concept is in their native language. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great. Well, thank you guys. Um, and thank you, Dr. Reynolds, for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, thank you, everybody, for participating today in our first of seven uh, lectures this summer. We will be putting this lecture up on our website and sending a video copy to all registered guests. Uh, please join us next Saturday, July 25th at 4 p.m. Eastern time for our next lecturer, Dr. Carlotta Penn and she'll be discussing multicultural perspectives on language and literacy. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. Uh, thank really you for appreciate having it. Me. I enjoyed being, being with you all today. Great, thank you. Thank you everybody, enjoy your Saturday. See you Bye -bye. next week. <laughs>